Standing Senate Committee on uh, Social Affairs, Science and Technology. And Chair of the Committee, and I'll ask uh, those who are here with us today in the committee to please introduce themselves. I'll start on my left. That's you. Bon matin. Ontario. Mark Ontario. Good morning. And around to the other side, Linda Manning. Fabian Manning, Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, Victor O, Ontario. Bruce McQuaid, New Brunswick, Gavin Okay, uh, today uh, we continue with our very lengthy deliberations, hearings uh, with respect to Bill C-45, an act respecting cannabis and to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Criminal Code, and other acts. Now, the purpose of today's uh, sessions, and there are four of them, and four of them relate to the other committee reports. Uh, the reports that came from legal constitutional affairs, came from Aboriginal affairs, um, came from uh, the uh, Committee on National Security and Defense and the Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade. So we've allotted one hour for each of these um, uh, reports. Uh, we've, we've had, of course, a report from the committee. The committee steering committee, the chairs, the deputy chairs have come in and have uh, uh, commented uh, on their reports. And now uh, we have officials. Uh, we invited ministers. We invited, uh, uh, in lieu thereof, parliamentary secretaries. Uh, what we have today are officials, uh, very competent officials, I might add. Uh, but what we need to know is uh, the recommendations. And for example, I'll take this first one, uh, legal and constitutional affairs. The recommendations start on page 10. Now, the, the, this first group of eight recommendations uh, was passed unanimously by the, uh, uh, the committee. So what I would like to hear uh, from our officials, and this would follow in the other uh, cases, is uh, the reasoning behind the government's position or the, the, the position that was put through the House of Commons or the position of uh, the, the departments with respect to these amendments. Um, uh, they don't have to necessarily address the policy question in the amendment. Uh, but uh, why, uh, why these particular uh, changes were not uh, put into the, uh, the act uh, at, uh, at the common stage or at its committee stage, uh, what is it that the, the government feels is right about the bill? It doesn't require these kind of recommendations. So uh, does that seem reasonable to everybody? We could start out with that, with asking our officials to, to comment on them and then take questions uh, from the, uh, the members of the committee. That sound reasonable? Okay. Alrighty. So, uh, the first uh, up is, uh, as I just pointed out, is the report of the Standing Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Uh, we have officials from uh, Help Canada uh, who are with us, uh, Eric uh, Costin and John Clare, and they're gonna be with us for all four uh, this morning. Uh, from the Department of Justice, Diane LaBelle and uh, Carol Morenci, uh, and uh, Paul Saint-Denis. Saint um, so welcome uh, to all of you, and uh, let me pose that first question about uh, the recommendations of this committee that were unanimously passed. They appear on page 10 of uh, their report, and uh, could you comment on uh, uh, the rationale for the government's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis these particular amendments. So, Mr. Costin, I'm starting with you. Sure. Thank, thanks very much, Mr. Chair, and to all the members. We're uh, happy to be back uh, before you, and we will certainly do our best to provide uh, some commentary on the reports that we'll be looking at throughout the morning. Uh, I think with respect to the nine proposed amendments that were unanimously proposed out of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, it'll, it'll likely, not surprisingly, require a bit of handing off amongst those of, at the table. And perhaps even in one instance, we may, with your indulgence, uh, uh, lean on one of our colleagues from the, the Public Safety uh, Department. Um, but without necessarily uh, eating up any of the clock with any other sort of inter introductory comments, if, if, if you feel like we can just sort of start in with 
with the first one, and I turn to my colleague Carol, sure. who will who will begin at that point. Or I'm sorry, Deanne. Good morning, and thank you for inviting us to appear before you. Uh, with respect to the um, first recommendation, which is uh, speaks to um, the uh, PT provincial and territory legislative authority over possession and cultivation and propagation and harvesting of cannabis plants in designated areas, including the power to prohibit it. Um, I would like to provide, um, by way of explanation, um, what the Minister of Justice, Wilson Raybould, um, stated before the committee uh, on legal and constitutional affairs. Um, the purpose of uh, the Cannabis Act is to put in place a national regime for the legalization of cannabis, and that the purposes are articulated in Clause 7 of the legislation and um, are to be considered in terms of providing a legalized regime that is strictly regulated and that provides access to individuals right across the country. She also indicated that the provinces and territories do have the latitude, the ability, to uh, modify the number of plants, go from four to two plants, uh, to add uh, cultivation restrictions. Um, and however, because it is a plan uh, intended to apply nationally and to provide legal access uh, to everyone of an adult age in the country, um, it is possible that if an individual were to challenge a provincial law or a municipal law that prohibits the cultivation altogether, um, that a court would then be faced with examining uh, the municipal or the provincial or territorial law against the federal legislation to examine if there is a conflict or not. And so the federal purposes would be examined. If there is a conflict with the federal purposes, it is possible that a court would find that the federal law prevails. And I would uh, close by saying on this that the Minister of Justice um, explained to LCGC um, that this is about establishing access uh, nationally for adult uh, consumers. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now, members of the committee, we could either do these one at a time or we could go through all uh, eight of them and then uh, do the questions. That might be the, the, the better way. Yeah. Okay, so the second one is uh, amend the bill to increase the allowable period to pay a ticket following uh, conviction. By the way, your answer was just the kind of thing I'm looking for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that provision um, came as a result of a testimony suggesting that uh, individuals in uh, rural or isolated areas would require more time to pay a ticket. Um, Presently, the, uh, the ticketing regime allows for uh, a, a period of time during which an individual can, can pay the, the ticket voluntarily. That period of time is not stated in the provision of the Act. It's, it's uh, a provision that allows the, the provinces to uh, select that period of time. Typically, uh, under provincial schemes right now, that period of time ranges anywhere from 15 to 30 to sometimes 60 days, depending on the type of offenses that are uh, at play. And once that period of time uh, for the voluntary payment of the ticket has elapsed and nothing has been done, the, uh, the person who's received the ticket, the accused, is considered to uh, have been found guilty. After that moment, from the time that the, the uh, accused is considered to be guilty, the act provides for a period of 30 days for the individual to pay the amount uh, identified in the ticket. Uh, so in total, the, 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 uh, the, the, the amount of time that an individual would have, depending on the province, could range anywhere from 45 to almost 90 days. Uh, so that, that's one issue. And then the, the other thing is, is, is that um, even in the case of individuals who are um, uh, who live in isolated or in, uh, in uh, rural areas, uh, payment is, is likely to be uh, available either by mail, by telephone, or by internet. And so it, is, it seems to us that that, that, that provision uh, may not be uh, necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, number three, uh, amend the bill in order to relieve law enforcement agencies of all responsibility regarding the con conservation, return, or compensation of seized cannabis plants. I think if it's all right with you, I'll turn to my yes, colleague at the that's second quite table. Fine. That's quite fine. Yeah, sure. The purpose of this um, uh, is really about the issue of storage uh, for law enforcement. And of course, um, seized property um, is something of a responsibility that's important um, until uh, court cases are um, proceeding. Uh, and of course, um, the issue here is uh, for law enforcement, there are already provisions in the CDSA that allow for early destruction. And of course, we're talking about uh, property that doesn't present um, a threat. So we're, we're not talking about things that are national security uh, threats or health threats. Uh, those would be normally uh, disposed of uh, in immediate circumstances. But for those things that don't, there are already provisions in the CDSA uh, that allow for early uh, destruction. And so uh, the preference for law enforcement would be uh, for those provisions uh, to be uh, in the bill, uh, C-45. So, Chair, maybe I can just leave it there or perhaps turn to my colleague from the RCMP. Any comment from the RCMP? Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Dennis Daly with the RCMP and Contract Aboriginal Policing. Um, what I can simply add is that the, um, the RCMP, nor am I aware of any other uh, policing uh, agency within Canada, are, are not set up with either facilities or resources to be able to tend to live plants. So that would be the only thing that I would um, mm -hmm. add. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Item number four, ensure that the THC levels be clearly indicated on labels affixed on cannabis products and its derivatives. Uh, as recommended by the Quebec Association of uh, Psychiatrists and provide for the proposed approach to the regulation of cannabis in order to protect the most vulnerable, including young persons and people with mental illness. Mr. Costin, yeah. I'll automatically turn to you, Mr. Costin, yeah. and you can deflect it to anybody else. Yes, yeah. thank you. So uh, on this one, uh, the this is sort of the spirit behind what we understand to be the recommendation is something that the government kind of wholeheartedly takes on board. Uh, in fact, the need for clear uh, and precise uh, labeling is something the task force spent quite a bit of time looking at as part of their recommendations. <coughs> uh, it's something that, that we've learned uh, from the U.S. states uh, uh, quite, quite specifically. And frankly, it's a practice that exists today under the federally regulated system. <coughs> THC limits, uh, THC levels rather, CBD levels are all mandatory information that are required to be on labels today. Uh, I would, I would uh, suggest that in uh, uh, in 139 1k of c45 you'll see reg making authority that actually is specific to the question of potency uh, which is of course uh, an expression of thc and cbd uh, further to that uh, a number of uh, months ago we the department published a paper <coughs> setting out intentions to regulate included in that were mandatory requirements that would uh, effectively fulfill this. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, Mr. Chair, is the, the reason for uh, in putting, putting these levels, THC and CBD, in regulations is the reality that we're talking about a, a novel and innovative industry space. And so as the regulator, we need uh, an instrument that allows us to respond with a certain amount of agility and dexterity should we see any practices in the industry that give us cause for concern and would allow us to make quick adjustments, thus the requirement uh, being uh, proposed uh, as, as a regulatory authority. Um, I think, is there anything you'd add, John? That's what I'd say. I'd say Thank, you. That one. Thank you. Uh, my colleagues uh, will be coming with questions on these uh, pretty soon. Uh, item number five, uh, amend the bill to impose a limit on the quantity of dried cannabis or its equivalent that as an individual is allowed to possess for personal use in a dwelling house. So I'll take that one again and, and maybe turn to colleagues for, for additional comments if needed. Uh, so I, again, I think with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues, um, they, were, they were first identified 
uh, as something that the government asked the task force to look, to look at. And in this case, it's a question of, of limits. And, and in the task force report and in subsequent conversations with U.S. state jurisdictions and part of the government's analysis of the issues, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that a possession limit in public is not only uh, a prudent and necessary measure, it's an enforceable one. <coughs> um, uh, the question of extending a limit into the home it, uh, is, however, and this is, again, we'll go back to the task force report, uh, is something that really challenges the questions of, of enforceability. Um, with respect to concerns that large quantities of cannabis uh, held in the home would be in and of themselves indicia of trafficking, I would remind or, or, or note that the, the bill makes it very clear that possession of cannabis for any amount for the purposes of, 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 of trafficking re would remain uh, a, a, crim a criminal offense. Um, Furthermore, uh, with respect, there's a certain practicality that exists when we contemplate um, allowing a home cultivation. And so recognizing that there's an, an, a considerable amount of variability with respect to how much cannabis a plant can yield, uh, when, and for, that four plants can yield. And it goes everything from whether you're growing it indoors, you're growing it outdoors, you're a proficient gardener, you're not a proficient gardener, the type of plant that you're harvesting. And so it really makes identifying a possession limit in the home that is rational and that a person could uh, reasonably be thought to comply <coughs> with very, very challenging. Thank you. Nobody else? Yes? I, I would only add one other comment, which is that once the uh, height restriction on the plants was removed uh, right. in the other place, right. uh, that would compound the point that my colleagues already made about trying to assess the yield from a plant. Of course. Okay, item number six um, is the committee endorses the recommendation of the Quebec Bar, which proposes to add to the Cannabis Act uh, Clause 5.1, which would read as follows, understood that nothing in this act shall be interpreted in such a way as to limit the provisions of the Youth Criminal Justice Act, including the use of warning, caution, referral, or extrajudicial sanction. So yes. that, that would be me, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Section 5 of the Act already clearly provides that the Youth Criminal Justice Act fully applies to any provisions uh, governing young persons. Mm -hmm. So there's no uncertainty about that at all. Um, and we've, the, we've been very clear in answering questions on um, the Youth Criminal Justice Act and the government as well in terms of the YCJA is very much designed to address uh, rehabilitation uh, uh, for young persons. And so the, it's, it's integral to how young persons who are committing offenses under C45 would be addressed. And all of the provisions of the Act, including the requirement to consider alternatives to charging, warning, cautions, uh, directing a young person to a community resource, all of that will continue, would continue to apply under the Act. Okay. Uh, item number seven, amend the, unless there's any other comment uh, from officials uh, on six. Okay, item number seven, amend the bill to increase the maximum fine for an organization found guilty of illegally exporting cannabis at 300,000 amount, which is provided for in the Tobacco Act. Take that one. Okay, sir. Is it Saint Denis? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at section 11 of, of the Act, uh, 11 sub 3, the, uh, the provision provides for uh, a term of, of um, 100,000, or rather a, a fine of $100,000 uh, if prosecuted uh, by way of a summary conviction. However, if, if the offense is considered to be serious enough, prosecution can proceed by way of indictment, in which case there's no limit to the uh, amount uh, that a fine can be imposed on, on a, a organization. And so we are not, we do not think that that is necessarily uh, an amendment that's called for. Additionally, we'd just like to point out that in the case of, of this particular offense, this is a, a, an offense, uh, a, a criminal law offense, and the, the maximum of $100,000 fine for a summary conviction uh, offense is, is identical to what the criminal code now provides for criminal offenses generally, and we think that that, may, that consistency should be maintained. Okay. 
Thank you. And uh, number eight, considering the provinces have all announced their intention to prohibit the possession of cannabis for young people under the age of 18, the committee recommends that the bill provide that no harsher sanctions be applied to youth than are applied to adults. We've heard that particularly in regards to the 30 grams versus the 5 grams, for example. Your <clears throat> response on that? Yes. So, um, core to Bill C-45 is to ensure that youth do not have access, easy access to cannabis. And so the bill proposes to strictly prohibit selling, giving, distributing, uh, sharing of cannabis from an adult to a young person, including a new offense of uh, using an, a young person to commit a, a cannabis-related offense. If a young person does come into to con uh, does have access to a small amount of cannabis, Bill C-45 reflects that there's uh, two, two ways to deal with it. If they come into, if they access and possess over four, five grams of cannabis, then that is an offense under the Act. However, if the young person has in possession five grams or less, C-45 does not propose to criminalize that. And this is a recognition that uh, bringing the full weight of the criminal justice system to bear on a young person for the possession of a small amount of cannabis uh, may bring greater harms than, uh, than the idea of, of trying to prevent access entirely to, to the cannabis. So Bill C-45 um, it does draw a distinction between young persons and adults in terms of possession. Adults will be able to possess up to 30 grams in public. Youth will not be uh, entitled to possess over 5 grams. If they do possess over five, uh, under 5 grams, they will be uh, dealt with under provincial laws. Uh, so under their jurisdiction over, for example, uh, under their rights over property, civil rights, uh, they'll be able to deal with young persons. They have all either uh, announced the intention to not allow young persons to possess any amount um, or, and to, or have uh, actually adopted legislation to that effect. Um, some have questioned why is there a different treatment for adults to be able to possess 30 grams and why youth and not at all. The Minister of Justice has tabled a charter statement that speaks to this issue as well, and that the evidence is there to indicate that the risk of harm to young persons, including to, to their health, is greater uh, through the use of cannabis. So there is evidence there to support a differential treatment, and the charter statement does speak to the, uh, the the, the minister's view that this is com consistent with the Charter. Um, there are other provisions generally in, in um, as I mentioned in my previous answer, Youth Criminal Justice Act also brings another light to bear on this. A young person who is committing an offence under the uh, C-45, possessing six grams, for example, will be treated differently than an adult because they'll be processed under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. As I mentioned before, that act provides a different, seeks to achieve a different objective and provides different levers to police to address the issue up front. As I mentioned, there are, there's a requirement to consider alternatives to charging for minor offenses, warning charges, diversion. Uh, so it is a treatment that is different than the adult for a small amount as well, and, but to the advantage of the young person. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That deals with the eight recommendations that the committee adopted unanimously. There were, there's a, another one that was accepted on majority. There's one rejected on majority. And then if you go over the next two pages, you can see other motions either rejected or observations uh, that were adopted by the committee. I'm not going to ask you to go through those, but I will say to colleagues, if you want a question on any one of those uh, uh, or any other aspect of this report, please... Uh, please go ahead and do that. Uh, but we have your comments with respect to the eight that did uh, pass unanimously through the committee. So let me now uh, go to uh, my colleagues and uh, we'll try the usual five minutes, uh, which includes questions and answers. So the more succinct the question the, and the quicker the answer, the more you get in. Starting with the deputy chairs, uh, Senator Petticler. 
Merci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of the witnesses for being here and for your answers, which were very clear and which shed light on these issues. I would like to hear a little more about these matters at the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee and on this committee as well. Um, we talked about the constitutional implications of uh, growing cannabis at home. So, and with regard to recommendation one. So my question is quite simple. In the interest of all parties concerned, of the provinces and of the federal government, would it be a good idea to clarify these matters before the bill even receives royal assent? Thank you for the question. The government's policy, as expressed by the Minister of Justice, is clear. This is a national issue. That is to give adults access to a legal source of cannabis. In some areas, this source includes people cultivating the plants at home. So under this national regime, the Minister of Justice said the federal legislation, if it is questioned, um, reiterated what I just explained. At this committee, and it is also alluded to in the report, we heard a lot about the impact of having an adult who might give cannabis to a minor, so someone under the age of 18. This adult would therefore risk a prison term of up to 14 years. Some witnesses talked about an older brother giving cannabis to a younger sibling of this. So this 14 year prison sentence might be harsh in some circumstances. What do you think about this? Thank you, Madam Senator. That's a very good question. If a young adult who's 18 or 19 gives or distributes cannabis to a 17 or 16 year old, this would normally be perceived as being a minor infraction. Yes, in the worst cases, the penalty could mean a 14 year prison sentence. But in the example you've given us, it would be a minor infraction and chances are that uh, there would be a summary conviction and the young adult could be either fined or if the young adult went to jail it would be for a relatively short time. So I think that this provision which includes this harsh penalty nevertheless allows the police to distinguish between a minor and a major infraction. And then the appropriate sentence would apply. Thank you very much. There, because this question of discretion by the police has also uh, been discussed a lot. Uh, concern that uh, some minority groups and indigenous people, racialized minorities, and people uh, who are poor are more likely to get the harsher treatment, more likely to be brought into the criminal justice system than, than those who are of middle class families uh, or upper income families who uh, might 
more readily, according to the statistics, might more readily not get that kind of a criminal uh, charge. What would you say to that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, uh, two things. Uh, the first is that that discretion already exists now with respect to cannabis and, and any other drugs. Uh, so, so police discretion is is uh, part and parcel of police responsibility. They uh, are are uh, expected to uh, act uh, reasonably and in accordance with the law and in accordance with all of the guidelines that that are imposed upon them by their own. Uh, uh, levels of, of agencies and so on and so forth. But uh, more importantly, I think, is that with the Cannabis Act now, what we're doing is we're going to be legalizing the possession of cannabis for up to 30 grams. That will benefit everyone, whether they're uh, part of a minority group or, or, or not. Um, that will take away uh, a large segment of what is now uh, a fairly large population group that is, uh, that is subjected to uh, criminal charges, some, some more than 20,000 a year individuals, uh, many of whom may be uh, from minority groups. That group will no longer be, uh, some likely will not, not be subject to, to any uh, police action because they'll be entitled to possess up to 30 grams. Okay, Deputy Chair uh, Senator Seidman. Thank you very much for this morning. Um, witnesses told our committee that in jurisdictions where cannabis is legal, the potency of available dried cannabis products is steadily increasing. Can you confirm uh, that Health Canada is not contemplating any limit on THC potency for dried cannabis products intended for inhalation? And I suppose, Mr. Costin, you might respond. Thanks for the question. Um, so, I mean, the, obviously the questions of THC potency are uh, uh, of, of great importance to, to, to everyone who's engaged in this conversation. The, I, I'm not a plant expert, and I'm not actually not sure in, in, uh, how many um, a, a plant experts um, appeared before you. Um, there's a, a kind of natural limit to how much a plant, how much of a plant can physically be THC. That natural limit is somewhere around 30%. The point that I think that, that you're making, and certainly the point that you, you heard from witnesses in the US jurisdictions, is that when you um, consider uh, extracted products, so, so products, or products that are mated with uh, um, THC that has been extracted from the natural plant. It's extracted and it, and it exists in a concentrated form. And it can be then used to create products that have THC uh, levels that are far in far excess of 30%. Like, like you're, you know, you, you've likely heard stories of 80, 90%, uh, near, near 100% THC uh, uh, concentrated pro products. So in the U.S. jurisdiction, and, and frankly, even in our proposals and our thinking, um, the, the conversation about limits and thresholds, whether they be total limit, like the, the, the total quantity of THC that could be in a package, for instance, or, and I think this is really the more important part, or how much THC in its concentrated form could exist in a portion size, and I, and I have no doubt that you heard witnesses that told stories in the early days in the U.S. regimes. They hadn't thought through some of these regulatory questions. And so you would have, uh, say, for instance, a chocolate bar uh, that, uh, that, that, that had no limits vis-a-vis -vis portion sizes. So you actually had a vast, vast amounts of THC in a chocolate bar. Uh, you might have eight or ten portion sizes and someone would consume the whole thing. Excuse me, I don't want to interrupt you, but I only have five minutes, so I don't mean to be rude. Yeah. But I'd just like to know if you could confirm that Health Canada is or is not contemplating any limit on THC potency for dried cannabis products intended for inhalation. The, the li only limit for dried that's being contemplated right now is with respect to any, any dried product that is in a, a pre-rolled form would have a limit of 0.5 grams per pre-rolled form. One more time. Okay, thanks. Two minutes. Uh, right. Okay, so let's move on. Um, 
Professor David Hammond from the University of Waterloo told our committee earlier this week that the packaging restrictions for cannabis are not plain packaging, but are better described as plain packaging-ish. So why is the Minister of Health and her department continuing to refer to the proposal publicly as plain packaging? And shouldn't we take the lessons learned from tobacco and apply them to cannabis if we're going to be successful in the so-called strategy of public health objectives of protecting youth? That is keeping marijuana out of the hands of kids. Um, so very familiar with Dr. 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 Hammond's work. Um, uh, we have in our proposal for packaging and lab labeling taking, taken many of the best practices out of the, the, the tobacco world uh, and, and, and the, 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 pro the, the program that, that they have in place for their packaging rules. Um, I think there is a, a competing interest here, it, which is also to create uh, a viable uh, industry where consumers have information, both brand information and product information that will effectively encourage them to participate in the legal marketplace. As you likely know, in the illegal marketplace right now, uh, branding, advertising, colorful packaging, copycat products are, are rampant. And so what we've done is try to apply the best public health lessons to, to a what we, we do believe is plain packaging. Uh, to, to, to Dr. Hammond's ish comment is, is, is an interesting one. At the same time recognizing that in, certainly in these early years, it will be very important to provide at least some, uh, some additional information to the consumer as they migrate into the new legal marketplace. Uh, it, 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 the, the, co the context of a public health approach at the same time as establishing a viable, competitive, regulated marketplace do require a certain balancing of some of these, uh, some of these issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, I might add, the, the, public health, the, the officials in public health will be here all morning, and they're here again on Monday. So as much as we can zero in on the questions relevant to this uh, uh, committee report from Legal Constitutional Affairs, the better, because we're, we're actually very tight on time uh, for this panel. Um, Senator Gold. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, everybody. Um, a minority of the Legal Affairs Committee recommended that the government limit THC potency to 16% for adults over the age of 21 and 8% for those aged 18 to 21. This committee has heard from Hillary Black, the founder of the BC Compassion Society, who said on this subject that it would simply likely be that users would simply consume more cannabis if there were limited potency uh, limits to get their uh, desired effects and uh, a risk of users diverting to the illicit market to obtain higher potency products. So if you, I would be interested in your comments. Since this legislation aims to diminish the illicit market, protect public health by deterring use and irresponsible and excessive use, uh, would you agree that this amendment would completely defeat the purpose of C-45, quite apart from it being somewhat unenforceable? So uh, yeah, so on the on the question of THC potency and limits, yes, I mean Ms. Black is knows this this very very well. Um, and the, the 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 reality is, is the marketplace today offers a wide variety of products. Consumers are increasingly interested in products with with uh, high, high levels of THC. Those products are currently entirely unregulated. The, there is very little information provided to the consumer, whether it's about the health risks of consuming those products or, frankly, what's in the product themselves. So the calculus, like the policy calculus behind the government's proposal is, uh, in order for this initiative to be successful, you need to create a regulated in industry, a regulated space that minimizes the harms that I've just described exist today and yet uh, provide consumers with a legal alternative to the, 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 the choices they have today. And by curtailing, uh, by, by limiting the, the product range, whether it's by the potency or, or by any other measure, you would likely simply retain a marketplace so consumers could, could, could access the product and they would continue to do so and experience the harms that they, hear, that they, they experience today. Thank you, Chair. If I may continue, yes. uh, again, on, uh, from the Legal Affairs Committee, on which I sit, as you know, uh, a minority of the committee um, expressed uh, concern about the time frame proposed for the regulation and legalization of cannabis. But this committee has heard from a number of public health experts uh, to, the, to the effect that, you know, every day there's another day of harm. 
uh, to those who are using and using uh, uh, unregulated uh, cannabis. Um, and indeed, the uh, Social Affairs Committee a few weeks ago heard from uh, representative of the Canadian Public Health Association who said, and I quote, we do not have the luxury of time. We need this legislation now to help minimize those harms and protect the well-being of Canadians. So what are your thoughts on the recommendation to delay the implementation of this bill? Would, what, would a delay have a potential social and public health consequences, in your opinion? Um, I <laughs> I mean, I think that, that, that I think in many ways some of the comments that I expressed in my earlier response stand for this question as well. That the the, the reality is is you have you know cannabis use is ubiquitous in this country. Uh, uh, arguably, if you want to use cannabis today, you are using it. You can buy it practically in any big city on any store street. And the reality is is the product that you're buying in those stores is um, derived from sources that are frankly unknown to us. Uh, I mentioned I won't repeat the harms associated with, with that, and I'm, I'm just talking about the health harms, and there are a whole series of social and, and other harms that are, 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 are uh, important to, to, to acknowledge as well. And so, the, again, the, the, the driving interest here is to uh, displace that current arrangement with a, a regulated arrangement and to decrease those harms. And um, and, and I'm aware that you certainly did hear from a, a lot of witnesses who indicate that the, 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 the sooner that that, uh, that process of displacement can begin, the sooner that uh, the harms felt by the current arrangement start to decrease. Thank you. Chair, do I have any more time? Uh, pretty much up. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Manning. Chair, and, and thank you to our uh, witnesses. Um, at the legal committee on March 22nd, Senator Batter asked a question that I would like to ask again because the answer was not that clear. Under part one of the bill, section 8.1 says that unless authorized under this act, it is prohibited for an individual to possess more than four cannabis plants that are not budding or flowering. Could someone explain whether that means that you could potentially possess more than four plants if they are budding or flowering? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the possession of plants, I think, can be summarized in, in, a, in a couple of statements. The, no one is going to be permitted to possess a flowering or budding plant in public, period. I think that that's yeah. relatively clear. Yeah. And it, is, it will be possible for an individual to possess uh, non-budding plants, uh, up to four non-budding plants, period. So in public, individuals will be able to possess four, uh, four non-budding plants, and they can possess that in either in public or in private. What if they're budding or flowering? And, and the four then, plants are, are then, home grown. Then they, so can, that... they cannot possess any, any budding plants or flowering plants in public at all, but will be able to possess up to four pl uh, plants that are budding in private. And that, that meshes well with, with uh, the provision dealing with cultivation, which allows for the cultivation of four plants in a dwelling house, which is a private area. So in public, no one can possess a budding plant. Yeah, but we're talking about the homegrown here. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's homegrown or not. I mean, when you buy your, if you're going to be buying your plant from a retail store, it will not be a budding plant because you will have to take that plant uh, from the store to your home, and at one point it will be in public. So the plants, we expect that the stores will be selling non-budding plants, non-flowering plants, uh, so that people can take those plants and and bring them home, and then begin to cultivate them. In the dwelling house, at home, in a private space, those plants will eventually flower at bud, and, and they will not be breaching the law. They just will not be able to possess the plant while it's budding in public. In, in regards to policing the homegrown uh, effort, uh, 
uh, I'm just wondering what uh, practices uh, are you prepared? I mean, how, how do you control or how do you police homegrown activity? If somebody's uh, you know, growing more than what they're permitted to grow, and like, does, does it have to be, I guess, a, a report file? Or, or how, how do you plan on policing the homegrown activity? Well, those, those, that question may best be posed to our colleagues from the RCMP when they'll be before you. I mean, I have my own views, but I, I will defer to them for that. Okay. I wish to uh, respond briefly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the RCMP will be prepared to enforce the legal cannabis regime when it comes into force. Having said that, when I approach uh, an investigation or anything in my law enforcement career, I look at the impact in totality on public safety. So some of the things I think about when I look at home cultivation, for instance, is uh, whether law enforcement will be able to quickly, easily identify licit cannabis versus illicit cannabis. Uh, I also consider uh, peripheral things such as will it increase uh, the ability to have home cultivation, will it increase the potential for violence in uh, home invasions, for instance. I also consider whether uh, fire safety is an issue. Um, uh, I, I, I look at things in totality. Uh, you know, how will I enforce? Um, you know, in general, speaking in general, when we get either a complaint from the public um, or whether somebody comes to tell us that they suspect there's more plants than are allowed under the legal cannabis regime, uh, then we would look at different techniques. It, it could be as easy as surveillance of the house, determining foot traffic. Uh, you know, we launch a, a total investigation uh, which may then... Um, allow us to seek judicial authorization to go into that house and uh, and see what is going, you know, see what is taking place. So, um, but again, I, I look at things uh, in a whole public safety realm versus uh, one aspect in the law enforcement side. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've got four uh, senators left on the list in 10 minutes, uh, so if we're going to end on time, if we run over time, then it will back everything up, but I'm in your hands in that respect. Uh, so four senators, and if you could tighten up a little bit both on the questions and the answers, and sorry, that's you, Senator Poirier, but she's our most efficient questioner. She gets more in than anybody. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for being here, uh, all of you. I have a couple of questions for Justice. Uh, my question, uh, the first one is, legal experts such as the Bureau du Québec testified that the government is at risk of class action lawsuit if labeling and promotion provisions are not improved. Did you anticipate a scenario of class action lawsuit against the government? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, this is also a question that was asked before us uh, when we appeared before uh, the Legal and Constitutional Committee. And it was also a response that we provided uh, a government response in writing to one of the Senator's uh, written questions. And um, justice examines every piece of legislation uh, for consistency with the, the Charter and with uh, the Bill of Rights. It also examines legislation for it to be consistent with any other um, legal um, rule or, or issue. And um, the legislation will be applied when it comes into force, if passed by Parliament, um, consistently with uh, the authority set out in the legislation and in the regulations. Um, more than that uh, involves uh, solicitor client privilege advice, uh, which I cannot um, share with the committee because this advice belongs to the government. So basically, is it a yes or no if you anticipate a scenario of a class action lawsuit against the government? Is that possible? Um, that is part of the legal advice that belongs to the government, and so I'm not at liberty to uh, express anything more. 
Okay. It would have been probably simpler just to uh, modify maybe C45 accordingly, but anyway. Second question is, uh, in its report, the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affair observed unanimously that the Government of Canada explores and adopt other measures to limit the intrusion of organized crime in the cannabis industry. Can you share with us if the government has made progress on this issue? And if yes, what have they done so far? And if no, why haven't they done anything more? So uh, again, I'll, I'll try to be brief. That, that's a, it's, a, it's a really, really important important question. There are, um, there are important new authorities proposed through C45 that would allow, as a regulator, um, before and during the process of, of vetting applicants, to be able to look carefully into and, dis and compel uh, financial information. And so to the extent that I understand the nature behind the recommendation and the advice was really around financial interests and the role that criminal organizations may play behind the scenes uh, and have an influential role in the operations of, uh, of the cannabis uh, company. Uh, the, the bill does propose important new measures that would exist over and above um, those that exist today. You, you're likely aware we do a very careful vetting uh, with, uh, with the RCMP of all of the key personnel. We have, uh, we have proposed through our, re our regula regulatory proposals a number of new measures that would further increase the scrutiny uh, of, of individuals looking to enter the industry, in, with specifically with a view of to meeting the recommendation that the committee uh, has, uh, has, has identified. Okay, thank you. My last question is just a follow up from Senator uh, Pitzklaas' question on the 14 year. Uh, could you please tell me that if that same scenario of a, a youth giving something to another youth having the possibility of getting a penalty of 14 years, if that was not cannabis but it was alcohol, would that same, would that be the same penalty as severe? Well, I would say, first of all, under C45, a youth that is sharing with another youth would not be captured as an offense. Um, and alcohol is not a criminal offense. So the treatment of it is dealt with through provincial regulation. So I couldn't comment precisely on how that is addressed. But I am aware that the provinces do address uh, youth, on, so under 18 or 19, whatever is the age majority in the province, to who access alcohol uh, and that there are offenses in place for that and for persons who provide it to them, who sell it to them uh, uh, when it's prohibited. Okay. From my understanding, it's a fine and it's nothing compared to 14 years um, for an offense uh, from a youth sharing to an, an, adult, an adult giving something to a youth uh, in cannabis is different than an adult giving alcohol to a youth, which is illegal also. Um, there's quite a bit of difference from, from what we heard from witnesses. That's a significant issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, the, the, the 14 years, I, I know a lot of experts who, or a lot of witnesses uh, point to the 14 years and automatically in their statements, there's the innuendo that that's the penalty that will be imposed. And, and in fact, it, it's never imposed, except in the, the worst of the worst of possible cases. So uh, uh, an adult, someone who's close in age, uh, either 18 or 19, who uh, gives uh, a cannabis to uh, a young person, someone below the age of 18, uh, will likely never be uh, penalized anywhere near 14 years. So, sorry, but if it's never, why even put it there? Well, because the... Uh, it, it, <laughs> The, the, the cases that you picked are the most innocuous ones, but there are possibilities for much more serious cases uh, of, of uh, perhaps organized crime individuals uh, distributing to youth for the purposes of the youth, uh, either selling or distributing to other youth, uh, in which case then you might want to consider imposing a much more serious uh, penalty on, on someone who's working for organized crime. Yeah, that so could happen it's with a very alcohol, too. It's, yeah. it's very fact-specific. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dean. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Um, I, I want to go back and help uh, out my friend, um, Senator Seidman, uh, and your question on THC limits. 
Um, and I think the most efficient way to do this is to just read what I think my understanding is. I believe that in the, in the um, draft regulations uh, uh, developed by Health Canada, um, uh, that, that THC limits are in fact dealt with. And, and my understanding is, my read of those regulations is that, um, that for dry cannabis, uh, intended to be smoked or vaporised, the, the natural limit of no more than 30% THC would apply. In addition, and, and, and I think Mr Custon caught this, in addition, dried cannabis products intended to be smoked or vaporised and, and that are sold in pre-rolled single-use forms couldn't contain more than one gram of dried cannabis to assist consumers in managing consumption. So we're talking about dose. For cannabis oil, the only other product that would be authorised in this first phase of legalisation, uh, there would be a, a proposed regulatory limit of 30 milligrams of THC per milliliter of oil, or 3% THC that is proposed. And further, for purposes of safe dosing, cannabis oil sold in single units, such as capsules, could not contain more than 10 milligrams of THC uh, per unit, a standardised amount that's consistent with limits established in most US states for products meant for ingestion. So, so my understanding, and, and, and I think if you could confirm this for us, I think this is the precise question that Senator Seidman was looking for an answer for. Is this, have I got this right uh, in terms of the proposed regulations? So I can answer that question. So that, that, that is correct. Those are the proposals that were set out in the regulatory consultation paper that the government published in November uh, in advance of, of, of drafting and finalizing those regulations. Okay, so, so for further, for practical purposes, to test my own understanding of this, um, I understand from talking to many producers that, that achieving 30% THC potency in scale sufficient for production and distribution is very, very difficult. And that in practice, probably 26 or 27% is the most, is the highest potency that can be produced predictably in scale for sale. And that indeed that, that, um, that is a product that is offered for sale in the medical system. In fact, a range of products from zero THC um, 100% CBD all the way to about 25 or 26% THC is the range of products in the market and that we might expect to find in a legal and regulated market and, and everything um, in between. I mean, my last point is, and this is just my point, that, that we would see a very limited um, two products, obviously in different forms, um, made available in the, in, the, in the legal market initially, in, in contrast to uh, what I might call a potpourri of, of products that we might find if we just walk down into Bywood Market to a store that I happened to pass the other night. Um, th those are both at the low end of the potency scale. And, and it is for that reason that to start to tinker with those and, and, and think about imposing potency limits um, is the thing that will indeed uh, cause, a, in psychology, a reaction effect. If, I, if, if, I, if I'm told I can only have 8% THC, I'm, I'm going to go find 16 or 26% or THC. So, so I, I'm trying to contextualize the whole issue of, of THC potency. There are indeed proposed limits, and there's a very clear answer to that. Uh, they're, they're in the proposed uh, regulations. There are explanatory notes associated with that. And um, I think that um, uh, for, for that reason, this notion of, of starting to cap in some way, especially related to wage at lower levels, will indeed, and I support the testimony that we've heard, um, have two effects. Increased consumption to achieve the desired effects that, that users, consumers will achieve regardless of how we try to limit it. And secondly, to run contrary to the purposes of the legislation and drive, in particular, young consumers to an illegal market that we know is not tested for potency or contaminants. And, and by the way, uh, neither is age tested on the way in the door to buy those products. So 
just wanted to add that I've used my question time. You used your time up. Uh, it didn't sound like a question to me. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you can use your five minutes as you see fit. Um, uh, Senator Ahmed Barr. I want to uh, stick with home cultivation, if I may. Um, a majority of the senators on legal not uh, voted to prohibit home cultivation, not unanimously, but a majority. Can you comment on the impact of, uh, of prohibiting home cultivation on Canadians who live in rural and remote communities and what that would do to their access? Um, so certainly through the, through, throughout the course of our work, uh, and, it, and it relates actually to, your question relates to comments made earlier around the, uh, the impact on minority or racialized communities, not only to rural or remote communities, but certainly in the course of my work and my conversations with uh, individuals or organizations, governments uh, in, say, for instance, Northern Ontario and Labrador, throughout Iqaluit, where not only is it perhaps unlikely that there will be a legal bricks and mortar retail store, uh, you know, within reasonable distance, um, that frankly access to the internet, credit card use, uh, access to credit cards are also limited. And so in those instances, um, the conversation about limited production for personal use really, really kind of appears to be the only, only kind of option alternative or the only option for legal access. So I think one thing is worth considering when, when looking at that recommendation that's made by, by the committee would be in, in, if it were to be prohibited outright in, in those instances where communities neither have access to a retail outlet, uh, individuals in the community are not necessarily uh, have easy access to internet or even as we, we, we've heard um, are, are likely to have credit cards. Um, uh, it would be uh, very, very difficult, uh, if not, not impossible, for them to have legal access. Uh, and there is concern that in those instances uh, you would see um, uh, kind of a, illegal entities move in to take advantage of those, those types of situations. Further on, we, we heard in uh, testimony from the Canadian Federation of Apartment Associations, you know, their fear that homegrown would do damage to the properties, including mold damage, for instance. Can you comment on that? So I, I, I'll, say, I'll say two things and, and maybe ask for some help if I get it wrong. So in the one, the, mm -hmm. the first part of the answer is just to, to, to reflect on the fact that the, this is really a cooperative proposal, wherein other levels of government, pursuant to the powers and authorities they have, can impose additional rules. So for instance, landlord and tenancy rules you know, could be made and tailored to, to mitigate some of the problems that, that you, you heard described. I think another bit of context that I might offer as, as a second part of my response is, the, com the committee may recall that we, we've mentioned something called the cannabis, the Canadian Cannabis Survey a few times. Yeah. One of the questions we ask in those, that, um, that survey is um, where people either currently access their cannabis from or where they're likely to access, access it from in, in in the future, of all persons who use cannabis, uh, only about 2% uh, uh, really think about uh, growing it for themselves. So when you uh, imagine a scenario where you have an apartment building uh, and the concerns express that perhaps every person in that apartment building will grow to the maximum amount, um, the data that we're seeing around the, li the likelihood of that scenario playing out would, would reveal that it's, it's a very, very unlikely scenario that pe consumers are telling us that if given the choice, they will go to the store. Thank you. Okay, that's pretty much it. Uh, Senator Tennis. I wanted to just uh, go back to your responses with respect to the uh, recommendations from the legal committee. And, and uh, specifically, I guess I'll start with the chief uh, who responded uh, on uh, number three. Uh, your response indicated that you do not have the capability to protect seized plants and nurture them and look after them and return them to uh, who they need to be returned to. You just don't have that capability. 
And so this amendment specifically is there to relieve you of that obligation uh, or to explicitly state you do not have that obligation. Would you appreciate that particular amendment uh, being included? Um, as I've said, for, for law enforcement, for me to make a comment on, uh, you know, a policy decision or something, my job is to enforce the law and simply advise that, uh, as you first stated, that we do not have the facilities nor the resources to tend to live plants. So um, it is something that's, that's part of my role is to provide that sort of feedback. So uh, if it's decided that uh, the law will be the law, then we will have to make uh, the necessary uh, improvements to then fall within the law. So there'll be a gardening division in the RCMP. We would have to make the necessary changes thank to you. fall within the law. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then secondly, um, uh, with number six, I think it was uh, uh, Madame LaBelle, you replied with respect to six that it, uh, the concern here has al is already looked after, that it kind of goes without saying, uh, that um, uh, that the youth, uh, uh, the youth are looked after, and maybe it wasn't you, whoever it was. Um, if it, if it, what would be the harm? If, if, if this is the intention, and I think it, you know, everybody said, uh, somebody said that the government wholeheartedly agrees with this. So, what would be the harm then, with explicitly saying? what we all feel and what we say goes without saying and so on. What would be wrong? The Quebec Bar Association, not a bunch of slouches, suggested that this amendment be put in. What's your, what's your answer for not being explicit? So, uh, thank you for the question. So my, my response would be, number one, the bill is already explicit to that effect in Section 5. Then the question would be, if this committee were to adopt this uh, suggestion, you would be followed by a second section that would be speaking to almost the same thing. And the harm would be perhaps causing unintentionally, no doubt, uh, well, what does the first one mean that you have to put the second one in? And if you don't put this in now in every other federal criminal law act coming forward, does that mean it doesn't apply? Does it mean the the elements of the Youth Criminal Justice Act don't apply. So I guess the response is two points, that, that the C45, as before the committee now, specifically addresses the concern, I would respectfully submit. Secondly, the harm would be it would adding in this additional clause right after that already clear provision would likely cause some confusion about what does the existing one mean? And so the Quebec Bar and the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee got it wrong. They just didn't read the bill properly. You're saying it's already in there. We appreciate what motivated the, the, uh, the, the recommendation to be as clear as possible. Our view would be that the bill is very clear and that despite the best intention of that recommendation, that it could have the unintended harm, uh, negative consequence of cause, causing further confusion, whether in C45 or now in another federal criminal law reform where there isn't two specific references that are made again going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, we're running over time, uh, but I, I think that this is a, quite a detailed report and, and does require uh, the kind of questioning it's been getting. Uh, I think, I hope we can make up for it on, on some of the later reports. I, I, I do have one question, and then I'll ask if anybody else has any burning question. But the uh, recommendation number eight from the committee, <clears throat> uh, you commented on that, uh, where they're saying that no harsher sanctions be applied to youth than uh, applied to adults. And, and you said, well, it, it won't work that way. It's not going to, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's going to bear all of that in mind. Um, but it's also going to be dealt with under the youth criminal justice system. And I realize it's a different system from the general system, uh, but it still has the word criminal in it. Uh, so does this mean that if it proceeds under that system that the person would in effect have a criminal record? So under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, a record would ensue if the young person was convicted 
there are rules in the Youth Criminal Justice Act that address how that record um, survives. It depends on the nature of the offense for a period of time, and then it ceases to survive. But the Youth Criminal Justice Act provides flexibility to law enforcement, for example, to rather than charge, which would lead to a conviction, to give the youth a, a warning or a caution. Since 2012, that warning or caution would be uh, documented, uh, but there isn't going to be a criminal conviction record that flows from that. So Bill C-45 seeks to um, uh, protect youth against having access to cannabis and it fully uh, relies upon the criminal Youth Criminal Justice Act to address any offenses involving young persons and it draws that distinction on the five gram uh, for a young person. They would not be criminalized for possessing under five grams whereas uh, the, the threshold is different for adults. But there's still a, the, the, uh, the information that we get, uh, the statistical information we get about charges, that there still are very substantial charges that are being laid now, even in this interim period while we're waiting for a new law, uh, that involve simple possession. And <laughs> the biggest category of users are, are, are young people. Um, so uh, what, what kind of comfort can we get from that when we see that, oh, there are still a lot of charges, a lot of criminalization that is potentially going on here, and that, that has a ruining effect on so many people's lives? So it's, it's a balancing of, a, of objectives. The task force recommended that youth be allowed <coughs> to possess the same amount as adults. The government, in bringing forward Bill C-45, believes that threshold is too high too much harm to the young person's health and well-being from the use of cannabis. But the government also recognizes that bringing the full weight of the criminal justice system to bear on a young person who possesses a very small amount, five grams or less, um, is, is a greater harm. And for that reason, is only proposing to criminalize possession by a young person over five grams. And below five grams, the criminal justice system is not engaged, but provincial responses would be engaged. So police under provincial responses would be authorized to seize the product, would be authorized to deal with them under their provincial um, offense regime. Yeah, it raises the question, which is worse, the, the, the use of uh, marijuana or the criminalization of marijuana, but anyway.